What I'm going to, to, to talk to you about today is a story, a long story, that uh, la uh, I think it started roughly 10 years ago in my lab. And uh, it took uh, five years before we started to understand what was going on. And uh, finally, now I think uh, that we are convinced that uh, this molecule, uh, gremlin, uh, also called DRM, down regulated by VMOS, uh, is a novel proangiogenic factor. And uh, is, uh, its proangiogenic activity is due to its capacity to interact with a well known uh, proangiogenic receptor, that is uh, the VGF receptor 2 uh, in mouse KDR. And uh, what uh, we think now is that uh, we can add uh, gremlin to this uh, long lasting list of angiogenic factors that have been discovered during the last 25 or even more years. And uh, as um, he mentioned, uh, it happened to me, and I was much younger than now, as you can see from this picture. Uh, I was involved in the characterization and purification of FGF2 as a proangiogenic factor several years ago in, in, in New York. And since then, uh, I studied FGF2 as well as other angiogenic growth factors. And the reason I'm showing you this, uh, this cartoon is just to show you the timeline and uh, of different, and they are not all of course, uh, angiogenic factors that have been discovered during the years with different approaches. Uh, some of them, like VGF or FGF2, have been discovered with a biochemical approach. I mean, uh, biohensy, chromatography, and uh, with hard work at the bench. And others instead have been discovered because of the phenotype of knockout mice or, or by, well, since they belong to a family of growth factors like all the members of VGF and so on. And the story I'm going to tell you about today is about gremlin that we discovered in the, let's say in the old fashioned style. Everything started, as I said, 10 years ago when uh, we were working on FGF2 as a proangiogenic factor and uh, we wanted to originate uh, an endothelial cell line in which FGF2 was able to induce an autocrine loop of stimulation in order to use the cell line as a model of a proangiogenic uh, uh, endothelium. And so we simply transfected these murine endothelial cells with FGF2, we got our transfectants, and we characterized these cells. And we found that the transfectants were highly tumorogenic when injected in mice, and also they were highly angiogenic when implanted on the uh, chicken coralentoic membrane. This is a typical angiogenesis assay that a lot of people use to characterize angiogenic factors. And I think this was nothing special, was something that we, we could anticipate it anyway. Uh, what was somehow most surprising was the different oscillation. The condition medium of our cells uh, was able to activate uh, normal endothelial cells in vitro. For instance, this condition medium was able to induce uh, sprouting of endothelial cells, uh, or also was able to induce uh, tube formation like structure on the matrigel, and uh, the condition medium of our transfectants was angiogenic when delivered on the top of the chicken coriantic membrane. Again, this was something quite obvious. What was really surprising for us was the fact that these activities were not neutralized by anti-FGF2 antibodies. So even though we got collected this medium from FGF2 transfected cells, the activity we found in the medium was not due to FGF2 per se present in the medium, but to something else. And it took us several months before we were convinced that this activity, that we were able to characterize it with different in vitro and in vivo assay, was due to a new, in those days, a new proangiogenic factor. So we decided to attempt the purification of this uh, new factor from the condition medium of our transfectants. And we use uh, a sprouting assay as an assay to follow the purification steps from the condition medium. And this assay is very simple. You get an, a spheroid of endothelial cells, so you incubate with your stimulus, and you will get sprouts uh, invading the fibrin gel surrounding the spheroid. So we 
started different chromatographic approaches and all the fractions we tested with this assay to, and we follow this bioactivity to follow the purification of our new androgenic factor. And uh, it took uh, Elena Stabil in my lab and Mirella in my lab uh, four or five years before finally we succeeded in uh, establishing a decent protocol that at the very end allowed us to get one HPLC run and in which we got two peaks that were bioactive. And finally we were able to sequence uh, those peaks to find out uh, which protein was responsible of our uh, bioactivity. And so by Malditoff analysis and so on, we finally characterized the protein present in these peaks. And this protein was uh, gremlin. We uh, confirm that this protein was indeed present in these uh, peaks because we went back to those fractions and we uh, performed Western blotting with anti-gremlin antibodies. We could confirm that indeed uh, in this fraction gremlin was there. So the point is, was uh, that looking at the literature, gremlin had been uh, characterized previously by different authors as uh, a BMP antagonist. That is a protein able to bind a different BMPs, bone morphogenic proteins like BMP2, 4, and 7, and uh, doing so preventing the interaction of B these BMPs with uh, their own receptors. On the other hand, what was known in the literature was uh, that uh, gremlin was somehow involved uh, in different developmental processes like limb bud formation in the chicken embryo as well as in mice. And there was, what was very interesting to us was that the fact that uh, in, in embryos, gremlin, the expression of gremlin is under the uh, regulation of FGFs. And uh, I just remind you that we had purified gremlin from FGF2 transfected cells, so it made sense. And uh, we also confirmed that, for instance, also in zebrafish, uh, gremlin expression was indeed under the control of G FGFs. For instance, uh, a zebrafish mutant in which uh, FGF8 is downregulated shows a downregulation of gremlin as well. So, gremlin was known in the literature as a BMP antagonist, but our data suggested that uh, gremlin was also a proangiogenic factor. Of, of course, we wanted to be convinced that gremlin was indeed, is indeed a proangiogenic factor, so we use a recombinant gremlin, and we tested this protein in different bioassays on endothelial cells in vitro. And again, we could confirm that the recombinant gremlin was able to induce endothelial cell sprouting, collagen gel invasion, and was chemotactic for different endothelial cell lines, either of murine or bovine of human origin. So in vitro, everything was okay. Also, we injected the uh, gremlin in zebrafish uh, in an assay, using an assay that we developed in our laboratory to show the proangiogenic activity of recombinant proteins injected in zebrafish embryos. And uh, we injected the protein here in this region of the embryo. And uh, the injection of a recombinant, of a, an angiogenic factor in this region will affect the formation of these vessels, the subintestinal vessel plexus. And, uh, if you inject VEGF, for instance, or gremlin or FGF2, you will get endothelial cell sprouting, as you can see here. And uh, these are the statistics, and so uh, gremlin in this assay was indeed angiogenic. Also, recombinant gremlin was angiogenic, again, in the chicken coronatoic membrane assay, uh, as a recombinant protein, or when delivered to the membrane, uh, by grafting on, on, on the chick embryo uh, cos cells that had been transfected with, uh, with gremlin. Also in this case we got a very nice proangiogenic response. So we were convinced uh, that uh, indeed gremlin is uh, a proangiogenic factor. So at this point we wanted to start to find out how it could be so, which was the mechanism of action of, of gremlin. Uh, I just remind you that we use this sprouting assay to characterize, to 
to actually to discover gremlin as a proangiogenic factor. And the uh, sprouting of endothelial cells is under the control of the angiopoietin tie system. So we wonder whether by any chance uh, gremlin could uh, somehow affect the angiopoietin expression in endothelial cells. And this turned out to be the case because indeed a gremlin is able to induce the upregulation of angiopoietin 1 but not of angiopoietin 2 in endothelial cells. This is uh, just a semi-quantitative RT-PCR and this is western blotting of the condition medium as you can see here the upregulation of angiopoietin 1 in uh, this was a dose response uh, experiment. At the same time, we found that uh, as for many other proangiogenic factors like VEGF or FGF, gremlin was uh, able to uh, activate NFA-kappa-B pathway. Uh, for instance, here you can uh, see the translocation of a P65 subunit from the cytoplasm to the nucleus of cells that had been stimulated for 20 minutes with gremlin. And you can confirm by Western blotting, you can confirm NFA-kappa-B activation by EMSA assay. Now, what was interesting to us was the fact that the angiopoietin 1 upregulation by gremlin was indeed due to an NFA-kappa-B pathway. Indeed, both uh, silencing of uh, the P65 subunit or uh, a chemical inhibitors of this NFA-kappa-B pathway, they all cause the downregulation of angiopoietin 1 induced by DRM gremlin. So gremlin stimulates angiopoietin 1 via NFA-kappa-B activation. But so what? Uh, we thought that uh, if an endothelial cell stimulated by gremlin will upregulate angiopoietin 1, there is a very good chance that angiopoietin 1 in turn will activate TIE 2 thus inducing an autocrine loop of stimulation. And indeed, in, in gremlin-treated cells, we could demonstrate the phosphorylation of TI2. And the phosphorylation of TI2 was prevented by neutralizing anti-angiopoietin-1 antibody. So not only gremlin induces an uh, angiopoietin-1, but angiopoietin-1 can activate its own receptor in endothelial cells possibly inducing an autocrine loop of stimulation. In order to demonstrate that, uh, we silenced uh, angiopoietin-1 <coughs> in uh, cells that had been stimulated by gremlin. And in this case, we found uh, that the capacity of gremlin to induce endothelial cell sprouting was completely abolished. Similarly, anti-angiopoietin-1 antibodies were able to abolish the capacity of gremlin to induce endothelial cell sprouting. This was not only true for murine endothelial cells, but also for human endothelial cells, as well as for the sprouting of endothelial cells sprouting out from human umbilical artery rings that we isolate from the uh, human umbilical cord. Also in this case, anti-angiopoietin-1 antibodies, as well as a soluble TIE2 receptor, that is a decoy receptor, were all able to abolish the sprouting-inducing activity of gremlin. Finally, also in the chicken coronary and toic membrane assay, again, anti-angiopoietin-1 antibodies or the soluble TIE2 receptor was able to suppress the proangiogenitive activity of gremlin in this in vivo assay, either when gremlin was uh, delivered as a recombinant protein or when it was produced by uh, cos transfected cells. So I think that we somehow defined uh, this signaling pathway in which gremlin, by inducing NFA kappa B, can induce upper regulation of angiopoietin 1, which in turn, by activating TIE 2 receptor, will induce endothelial cell sprouting and eventually angiogenesis. This was a nice story. We published that on blood. We were happy. But this story doesn't tell us anything about how gremlin can induce and it activate endothelial cells, which is the mechanism of interaction of gremlin with endothelial cells. I just remind you again that gremlin has been characterized as a BMP antagonist, that is, as a protein that by binding BMPs prevent, prevents their interaction with BMP receptors. And that activity doesn't fit with our data. So, 
we look at the capacity of a gremlin to interact directly with endothelial cells. And indeed, we found that the iodinated gremlin was able to bind endothelial cells as, and uh, as shown for many heparin binding proangiogenic factors. I forgot to mention you that during the purification procedure, we use heparin cephalos chromatography because gremlin is actually an heparin binding protein. We will come back on this later on. Uh, as I said, gremlin, as many other uh, proangiogenic uh, heparin binding factors, binds to endothelial cells both uh, to low affinity, high capacity sites. You, you can see here uh, with the KD in the high nanomolar range uh, with uh, hundreds of thousands of binding sites per cell that is typical of the interaction of a growth factor with uh, heparin sulfate proteoglycans. And, uh, uh, high affinity, low capacity sites, and that is with the KD in the low nanomolar range uh, with few thousands of receptors <coughs> per cell. Uh, not only that, uh, but iodine gremlin uh, was cross-linked with the endothelial cell surface, and they turned out to bind it to a 250K uh, protein, and the interaction was prevented by unlabeled gremlin, but not by BMP4 that is a gremlin ligand. Not only that, but a gremlin can induce very quickly tyrosine phosphorylation in endothelial cells, as shown by immunocytochemistry as well as by Western blotting. And beside NF-kappa-B activation, also a variety of intracellular signals like uh, FAC, Paxilin, and uh, ERK activation. All these data are in keeping with the possible interaction of gremlin with the putative tyrosine kinase endothelial cell receptor. So we wonder which was the receptor involved in this interaction. And at the very beginning, we again used a biochemical approach and that failed. It was a real nightmare, but we were not able to isolate the receptor going through the classical procedure, cross-linking, down, pull down, and mass spectrometry. It didn't work out. We found a lot of proteins, but not a receptor. Uh, so we went back to gremlin. And uh, we looked more carefully at the structure of gremlin to see whether we could get some hints about a possible receptor. Gremlin is a cysteine, not protein. That means that the structure of uh, this protein shows a uh, typical feature shared by a variety of cysteine knot proteins, characterized by the several residu uh, cysteine residues that form a series of intra-chain disulfide bonds. And uh, the presence of these uh, intra-chain disulfide bonds uh, leads to a very characteristic, uh, stable, three-dimensional structure of the protein formed by a cysteine knot, that is this ring, and the two anti-parallel uh, beta strands, fingers, and a heel that usually is an alpha helix. And this structure is shared by all the cysteine knot proteins. And here is a list of the subfamilies of the cysteine knot proteins. There are tens and tens of proteins that belong to this superfamily. And uh, what was very interesting to us, and we were very ignorant, we didn't know that, I have to admit it, is that we, when we look at this list, we found that also growth factors like PDGF and VEGF belong to this superfamily. And of course, since we were looking at the new, a receptor for a proangiogenic factor, at that point, we decided to focus on VEGF receptors, just in case. Before doing that, uh, let me just show you that indeed VEGFs are cysteine knot proteins. This is uh, the cartoon that I showed you before, and this is the three-dimensional structure of VEGFA as shown by X-ray uh, crystallography. And you can see the cysteine knot and the two fingers here, and the heel, the half helix heel here. OK? And what is, I wanted to point it out is that these regions are known to, to be involved in the interaction of VGFA with the receptor. 
with the receptors, because there, there are more than one. Now, first of all, we look at the, the sequence homology between VGF, A, and Gremlin. And the homology was not that striking, to be honest. But what I think was very interesting was that all the cysteines involved in the cysteine not in VGF A were conserved also in Gremlin. So, see these cysteines? Okay, they are present both in VGF A and Gremlin. You can predict somehow the three dimensional structure, or, or better, the secondary structure of your protein. And uh, when we compare VGFA with Gremlin, uh, it was somehow similar. So we decided to model the three dimensional structure of Gremlin on uh, using VGFA as a template and using the systems as a docking site for the model to dock on the VGF template. And we wonder how the stru three dimensional structure of Gremlin could turn out. And these are the results. This is Gremlin, the model of Gremlin. There are no real data about the three-dimensional structure of Gremlin. And uh, despite this loop that is not present in VGF, this is the overlap between Gremlin and VGFA. And uh, I think that what is very interesting, what was very interesting to us, was the fact that these regions are very, very similar. And I remind you that these two regions are those that are involved in the interaction of VGFA with its own VGF receptors. At that point, it was very logic to look at the interaction of Gremlin with VGF receptors. And uh, at the beginning, we used Biocore. We immobilized VGF receptor 2, that is uh, the proangiogenic VGF receptor, the prototypic uh, proangiogenic VGF receptor. So we immobilized VGF receptor 2 on the sensor chip, and we look at the capacity of Gremlin to bind to the chip. And we got a very nice binding with a decent KD in the, with a nanomolar range that was, was not too bad, not too far from what we could get with VGFA. The interaction appeared to be specific to this chip. We could see the binding of VGF, of course, of Gremlin, but not of FGF2, and vice versa. Gremlin does not bind to FGF receptors. Then we look at the, comp the capacity of a soluble receptor to compete for the binding of a Gremlin to immobilize VGF <coughs> receptor 2. And we found that indeed the soluble VGF receptor 2 was able to prevent the interaction of Gremlin with the immobilized receptor 2, whereas VGF receptor 1, VGF receptor 3, or 1-FGF receptors they were no, all not able to compete. Thus, pointing to the specificity of the interaction of Gremlin with VGF receptor 2. We could confirm this data by a competitive ELISA assay in which we immobilize VGF receptor 2 or VGF receptor 1 to the plastic. And when we look at the capacity of Gremlin to compete for the binding of VGFA to its own receptor. And as you can see here, Gremlin is able to displace a VGFA from VGF receptor 2, like VGFE does, whereas is not able to displace a VGFA from uh, VGF receptor 1, at variance with PLGF, that is a VGF receptor 1 agonist. So these data show, again, that Gremlin is able to bind the VGF receptor 2, at least in these v in vitro assays, is able to compete uh, with the VGFA for VGF receptor 2 interaction, but at the same time, VG Gremlin does not bind VGF receptor 1 and possibly does not bind VGF receptor 3 at variance with VGFA. Okay, uh, but uh, biochemistry is a very nice science, but doesn't tell you what's going on in the real world, so we wanted to be sure that. Gremlin can indeed bind the KDR, VGF receptor 2, or endothelial cell surface. So we cross-link uh, uh, Gremlin uh, on the surface of endothelial cells, and we pull down with the KDR antibodies, and we look 
and we blotted with anti-gremlin antibodies. And we were able to see, again, a VGF receptor 2 doublets uh, showing up in this assay. And the binding of gremlin to KDR, again, also on endothelial cells, was inhibited by an excess of the VGFA, again showing the competition between the two ligands. We use also a different uh, um, cross-linking approach in which uh, we use a gremlin bound to a B-functional photoactivator activable uh, biotin cross-linker. Uh, very quickly, this, in this assay, gremlin is able to transfer the biotin moiety to the receptor once it's bound to the receptor after UV radiation. So if your gremlin binds to the receptor, at the end of the experiment, the receptor should be biotin labeled. And this is indeed the case. Gremlin is able to transfer the biotin moiety to KDR, and uh, this transfer could be competed by, again, a molar excess of VGFA, confirming the capacity of gremlin to bind VGF receptor 2 in competition with VGFA. As you know, tyrosine kinase receptors, once uh, they are engaged by the ligand, they dimerize. So we wanted to demonstrate that also gremlin is able to induce dimerization of KDR, VGF receptor 2. In order to do so, we transfected the endothelial cells with uh, the FRET uh, uh, couple CFP, YFE, VGF receptor 2. We transitly transfected these cells, so we stimulated these cells with gremlin or VGF, and we look for a FRET signal that is indication of the dimerization of the two uh, uh, KDR subunits. And uh, here, as you can see here, we got exactly the same results when we stimulated endothelial cells with VGFA or gremlin, but not with FGF2 thus indicating that indeed gremlin is able to induce KDR dimerization. This means uh, that the receptor is activated at that point, uh, you would anticipate to see KDR phosphorylation. And this is indeed the case, uh, to make a very long story short, gremlin is able to induce uh, VGF receptor to phosphorylation. It can be demonstrated by uh, phosphospecific anti-KDR antibodies uh, with uh, Time, very quick, very rapid time course and uh, in a dose-dependent manner. And uh, this can be demonstrated by Western blotting or by immunohistochemistry by using exactly the same antibodies. <laughs> this is uh, true not only for these tyrosine residue, but also for a second tyrosine residue that is again phosphorylated by VGFA, following activation of, by VGFA, that again can be phosphorylated also by gremlin. And the pattern of tyrosine phosphorylation of endothelial cells stimulated by gremlin or VGFA is quite similar, and this pattern can be mm, inhibited by a typical anti-KDR uh, 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 antagonist like the Sugen uh, 6416, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 5416, uh, that is a tyrosine kinase in inhibitor. <coughs> okay, so is this interaction able to transduce a biological response? And we look at endothelial cell motility. And as you can see here by time-lapse microscopy, gremlin like VGFA can in stimulate the motility of endothelial cells. The motility can be dramatically increased following overexpression of KDR, and this occurs both for VGFA or gremlin, and uh, the motility induced by gremlin as well as by VGFA can be inhibited by uh, VGF receptor 2 antagonists, thus confirming that this activity is mediated by the activation of VGF receptor 2. This is uh, true also for human endothelial cells. These are spheroids formed by UVEX, and these are the sprouts that originate following DRM uh, gremlin stimulation. And again, sprouting is inhibited by, induced by gremlin is inhibited by a, a peptide antagonist of KDR. And uh, also sprouting from the human uh, umbilical artery rings can be inhibited by KDR antagonists. So, Finally, we went in vivo in the chicken coronary membrane, and again, 
the activity of gremlin as well as the activity of VGFA could be inhibited by uh, VGF receptor 2 antagonist, whereas uh, the activity of FGF2 was not affected, thus confirming the specificity of the effect. So I hope that uh, in this way I convinced you that uh, indeed the gremlin is able to bind KDR to activate the receptor to induce a biological response in vitro and in vivo. Now, to conclude, just a few minutes. Uh, that's interesting, but so what? That's the question that drives my lab crazy when I ask people, so what? And drives myself crazy because, and at this point, I wonder what does this mean? So why do we need a one more VGF receptor to ligand. There are already plenty, a lot of them. So I don't, I cannot tell you. Uh, of course, since I've been working, I spent my life working on angiogenesis and tumor angiogenesis and inhibitor of tumor angiogenesis, uh, we started thinking about tumors, of course. It was quite obvious, nothing very smart. And uh, if you look, for instance, at this database on combine, you can see that the gremlin from this database is upregulated in different uh, lung uh, cancers. We had the chance to take a look at a few samples of uh, human lung cancers by immunohistochemistry for gremlin. And we were very surprised, but also very happy, to see that indeed, uh, endothelial cells within the tumor, but not in the normal tissue, uh, they do express gremlin. And uh, this is very nice, I think, because uh, it's, it fits with our original observation, in which we show that uh, endothelial cells stimulated by FGF2, indeed, they do overexpress gremlin. So there is the chance that in a tumor, endothelial cells my overexpressed gremlin because they are stimulated by other angiogenic factors like FGFs, for instance. It's just an hypothesis. But it, it was very nice to see that indeed these in vivo data in humans uh, somehow fit with our uh, data in, in the lab. Then, uh, uh, looking at the literature, we found this <coughs> paper that somehow was in keeping with what we found. Uh, in this paper, they look at the expression of gremlin in a variety of tumors by uh, in situ hybridization. And what they found was that indeed, also in their hands, gremlin was expressed by the stroma of the tumor, not by the tumor cells, but the stroma of the tumor. They did not define whether the stroma component expressed in gremlin was were fibroblasts or smooth muscle cells or endothelial cells or inflammatory infiltrate, Nothing like that. They just show that they, that is expressed in the stroma. What I think is nice is that also in our, uh, in, in our tumor model, in which we injected the human tumor cells in newt mice, we found uh, that, uh, again, uh, the tumor graft was indeed positive for, for gremlin, but again, uh, by immune histochemistry, gremlin was present in the stroma, here in yellow, but not in the parenchyma. And by using spatial specific primers, that could discriminate between a gremlin of human origin that is produced by tumor cells or produced by the host that is of murine origin, uh, we could actually demonstrate that in all the graphs we look at, gremlin was indeed of murine origin and not of human origin. That means that it was produced by the stroma and not by the parenchyma. Unfortunately, things are always much more complicated than what you would like. The fact that uh, gremlin is expressed uh, by the stroma of several tumors does not say that cannot be expressed by tumor cells. Looking at the literature, we found that indeed there are tumor cell lines so that they do actually express gremlin. And also, uh, Vincent Castronovo, uh, a pathologist in, uh, where is it? Is in Belgium? I forgot. Leuven, did you? I forgot. Anyway, in Belgium. 
is a Sicilian guy, uh, is a pathology, he worked in pathologist, works there, and he performs some immunohistochemistry uh, with anti gremlin antibodies on pancreatic cancer or prostate cancer. And in those cancers, he found an expression of gremlin not in the stroma, not only in the stroma, but in the tumor cells. Saying that probably, and now we are screening tumors, uh, gremlin can be expressed either by the stroma and by the tumor cells. And at this point, the situation is very, very complicated. Since we didn't know whether to express gremlin in the stroma or in the parenchyma, we decided to be very diplomatic, and we took non-differentiated embryonic stem cells that were not stroma, they were not parenchyma, they were everything, and uh, we expressed gremlin in these cells. We overexpressed gremlin in murine embryonic stem cells. And then we grafted these cells on the top of the chicken coronary membrane. As you may know, uh, murine uh, um, embryonic stem cells, they form teratomas. Uh, that means multi-lineage tumors when injected in mice. Uh, we wanted to be cheap, and so instead of using mice, we use, we use egg, chicken eggs. Uh, it's much faster, it costs much less. And so we applied uh, our uh, murine uh, embryonic stem cells on the top of the chicken coronary time membrane, and we got teratomas as well. And when we look at the vascularization of these teratomas, those uh, expressing gremlin were much more vascularized than those, uh, than the mock uh, cells, the, the controls. And of course, this is something that is going on in our lab, and we are on the way of transfecting tumor cells and to see what's going on and so on. So, the very last comment. I started telling you that uh, gremlin is a BMP antagonist. On the other hand, I showed you one slide in which we could demonstrate that gremlin can bind KDR on the endothelial cell surface, and BMPs that do bind K uh, gremlin do not prevent the interaction of gremlin with KDR. There are no data about uh, the regions in the gremlin <coughs> molecule that are involved in the binding to BMPs or to KDRs. We know by homology that, uh, we, uh, let's say, we hypothesize by homology with VEGF that gremlin should bind KDR using this region, these two loops. On the other end, there are no data about the interaction of gremlin with BMPs in terms of structures, but there are a few data about the interaction of noggin, that is another member of the BMP antagonist, the BMPs. And uh, as for noggin is concerned, the interaction of noggin with BMPs is somehow in this part of the molecule. So what we started to hypothesize is that gremlin is able to bind with two different regions of the molecule, two different ligands. One, KDR. In this way, transducing a signal that uh, eventually will lead to angiogenesis. On the other end, by interacting with BMPs, will prevent uh, the interaction of BMPs with the receptor, that is, uh, switching off BMP receptor, BMPs receptors. Which is the balance between KDR activation and BMP receptors is not down? I have no idea. I think that the, we will need uh, several, several years trying to solve this crosstalk between KDR and BMP receptors and the role of gremlin or other BMP binding proteins in this interaction. So I hope I convince you that uh, this slide that is quite complicated per se could be even, made, could be even more complex by adding gremlin as a ligand of VGF receptor 2. I also showed you that the interaction with VGF receptor 2 is quite similar uh, to that shown by um, VGFA that involves uh, the activation of uh, alpha V beta 3 integrins. At present, we don't know, but we are willing to do the experiments, whether neuropilins that are partners of, in this interaction are somehow engaged or involved in mediating the activity of gremlin. 
We have no data at all. We, we need to start the experiments. Uh, and of course, we would like to know the biological, as I mentioned before, the biological significance of a father lingon that you know, makes this situation even more complex. Let me just thank the people in my lab. As I mentioned to you, Elena Stabile and uh, Mirella Belleri spent several years of their life in uh, trying to purify gremlin. Uh, Mirella is still working with me. Uh, Elena decided to leave. Uh, I don't know which was the smartest one, but uh, uh, it's a matter of fact that this is what happened. And uh, Stefania Mitola in my lab is in charge of the studying the interaction of gremlin with, with KDR. So, and Cosetta is doing all the threat analysis and uh, microscopy in, um, in, my, in, in my lab. Daria Leali has done a lot of BIA core data and uh, all the other people involved in the chicken coronary membrane signaling uh, and so on. I also have need to, 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 to acknowledge the help of Daniela Coltrini. She is uh, in the histology uh, group in, in our university for the immunohistochemical analysis on, on tumors. <coughs> and also a list of uh, collaborators that uh, helped us to, to reach this point in our desperate attempt to try to understand what, does, what gremlin does. Um, it's not that easy, but I'm confident in a couple of centuries we will understand <laughs> the situation better than we can do now. Okay, thank you very much for your attention.